So throughout the duration of our webinar, we will be discussing the following topics. How to promote healthy feminism, how abortion negatively impacts women, we're going to give tips on supporting women in crisis pregnancies, how to compassionately address women faced with crisis pregnancies, and give tips on how to help host abortive women. And if you have any questions, please leave them till the end when we'll have a question period. So I'm going to begin by discussing how to promote healthy feminism. So can you really be pro-life and a feminist? That is the central question. So just as a disclaimer, there are many feminist views that are contrary to the beliefs of pro-life and Christian women. However, you in no way are required to label yourself as a feminist or associate with the movement in order to demonstrate compassion for gender issues. There are numerous branches of feminism, such as radical feminism, that do not correlate with the pro-life message. And even if we disagree with some of the goals of feminism, that does not mean that the movement is intrinsically evil. Feminism creates conversations surrounding gender and um, gender injustices as well. So I would personally use the phraseology pro-woman to describe my stance, but due to the varying interpretations of feminism and the numerous feminist ideologies, um, it is possible for pro-lifers to deem themselves feminists. It's possible for people to associate with a subclass of feminism that, um, that opposes things that harm women, such as abortion, and promotes the well-being of women. So how can feminism be defined? So if you look at the definition of feminism, according to Webster's Dictionary, it is the theory of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes. According to this definition, the central purpose of feminism is to achieve gender equality in all of the previously mentioned categories. Although, Women and men are incredibly different from, from one another, and we must acknowledge the beautiful differences between men and women in order for societal progression to occur. Another way to define feminism is opposition to sexism. If women are treated in a way that diminishes their inherent dignity, then that injustice must be remedied in order to afford natural equality between the sexes. Women were the victims of historical oppression, which explains why the movement is female-focused, in order to establish equality. Women in Western countries are not currently oppressed, but continue to face certain gender-based discrimination to a degree. But it is not to say that men do not suffer or experience unique gender-based adversities. Those issues must be addressed as well. There is a distinction between being a modern feminist and being pro-woman. Being pro-woman entails having the best interests of women at heart and valuing the necessity for loving relationships between men and women, rather than pushing a divisive agenda. Pro-lifers are especially pro-women since not only do they support women, they fight for the rights of unborn women in their mother's womb. Now I'm going to delve into a brief history on feminism. So there are three major waves of feminism. The first wave of feminism generally focused on attributing legal rights to women, such as the right to vote, as well as property rights. The first wave of the feminist movement's central motive was to end the suffrage of women under the law. Once women were considered equal under the law, they could then focus on creating social equality between the sexes, and this paved the way for the second wave of feminism. So after the commencement of the sexual revolution in the 1960s, the second wave of feminism primarily focused on sexual liberation, gender roles, and workplace equality. The second wave of the feminist movement demanded for supposed reproductive rights, um, meaning access to abortion and contraceptives. Um, however, access to abortion is not an intrinsic right, nor should it be. In Canada, due to the sexual revolution and the feminist movement, abortion was decriminalized in 1969, and access to birth control as well as other contraceptives became widely accessible. The feminists of the second wave aimed to abolish gender roles in which women are submissive, maternal, and meant to stay home and care for their children. This was concerning since femininity can be characterized in terms of maternal attributes. The second wave of feminism worked towards broadening opportunities in the women, for women in the workplace. However, women do not need to choose between their careers and their families. So now this brings us to postmodernism, progressive ideologies, and the third wave of feminism. The third wave of feminism piggybacks off of the second wave by addressing unresolved issues, pushing a sexualized agenda, access to abortion and contraceptives, as well as removing gender boundaries and gender as a whole. The third wave, although can be divided into countless micro-movements such as eco-feminism, um, liberal feminism, radical feminism, et cetera, there are many disagreements within the feminist movement regarding the strategy for combating gender inequality. 
hence the reason for incoherence of feminist perspectives. Regarding specifically third wave Christian feminists, there is no contradiction when we use the term Christian feminism due to the countless perspectives of womanhood and the variance of feminist perspectives. So why should pro-lifers engage in the feminist movement? Oftentimes, many pro-life and Christian women do not wish to label themselves as feminists due to the supposed contradictions between, between being pro-woman and being a feminist. This is why it is so crucial for pro-life women to engage in the movement in order to weed out the toxic ideologies that actually hurt women, such as over-sexualization, abortion, the abolition of all gender roles and gender as a whole. By abolishing gender, we cannot claim gender issues as an issue. The feminist movement does in fact address many issues that disproportionately affect women and girls, such as domestic abuse, human trafficking, and sexual assault. In North America, we are incredibly fortunate to have access to many opportunities, such as education, job accessibility, and healthcare, although women do face specific gender-based adversities nonetheless. Women in many developing nations um, are not afforded the same rights as their male counterparts, such as education, a high influx of arranged marriages and child brides due to um, marital inequality, um, restrictions or denial of political engagement. So do not be afraid to engage in the feminist movement since not all feminists need to advocate for the same issues. Now I'm gonna talk about the different ways that we can promote healthy feminism. So we cannot claim that all feminists are the same and it's unfair to suggest that all people that label themselves as feminists share the same beliefs. Although most of the feminism that infiltrates social media can be constituted as radical. Radical feminists, especially in the media, um, label themselves as feminists and they say that they share the same beliefs as all women. Radical feminists also um, tell women to reject their biology and aim to dismantle all gender roles, although men and women are uniquely different from one another. Women have this beautiful gift that allows them to carry children in their wombs and bring new life into the world. Radical feminism attempts to deny the life-giving abilities um, of women. We must encourage women to embrace their unique maternal abilities by means of their fertility rather than denying it. That is not to say that all women are called to become mothers, and that is okay so long as women do not abuse this decision by means of abortion. As feminists, it is essential to promote a healthy outlook on female sexuality. This means understanding that human sexuality is an integral part of our being, but is not something that should be abused. Promoting promiscuity and a lack of respect for our bodies as seen in the porn industry and movies is actually incredibly harmful to women and damages the relationships between men and women. A question that Hollywood and mainstream media needs to ask itself is, do women achieve equality by replicating the values established by men? For example, the over-sexualization of women was primarily established by men so by overly sexualizing ourselves, are we achieving equality by feeding into the desires of men? Another means of promoting healthy feminism is by understanding that abortion and sex work are not acts of empowerment. Abortion has innate physical and psychological effects on women and kills millions of unborn women every year. Sex work is also incredibly damaging to women since not only is it never a first um, choice job, it is often met with abuse or assault. By admitting that abortion and sex work are forms of violence against women, we can help women to heal and protect them from these experiences. An integral way to promote healthy feminism is if someone who is a victim of sexual assault, abuse, or is post-abortive confides in you, take their testimony seriously, respond compassionately, and offer them help. It takes courage to speak out about abuse and abortion, therefore avoid skepticism and address their circumstance lovingly. And remember, do not feel obligated to support all aspects of feminism or even label yourself as a feminist. As pro-lifers, we are often told that we are not welcome within the feminist movement. But do not be discouraged and only focus on the feminist issues that you feel morally obligated to address. Being a feminist does not mean that you support sexual liberty, abortion, the abolition of gender roles, or gender entirely. You do not need to be a socialist or a Marxist or believe that women are men. You can form your own definition of feminism. Be discerning when it comes to any activism that you partake in and do not allow yourself to be swayed by the radical leaders of the movement. As Mother Teresa once said, be faithful in small things because it is in them that your strength lies. Even though most feminists say 
that abortion is important for feminism, abortion actually is hurtful and harmful to women. I will be explaining how abortion negatively impacts women based on research studies. Abortion can result in medical complications. A study sponsored by the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario found that women who had undergone abortion experienced four times higher rate of hospitalization, five times higher rate of surgical event, and nearly five times higher rate of hospitalization due to psychiatric problems. In 2000, the UK's Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists established that the immediate physical complication rate of induced abortion is at least 11%. This figure does not include complications that arise after days, weeks, or months. An American study from 2000 found an even higher complication rate of 17%. So the immediate physical complications of abortion include perforations, sepsis, pelvic inflammatory disease, pain due to endometriosis, uterine hemorrhage, retained fetal or placental tissue, and the long-term complications include uterine perforation, cervical damage, placenta privia, breast cancer, premature births, ectopic pregnancy, and future offspring have a higher risk of prematurity. Cerebral palsy and other disabilities result from prematurity. Abortion as a risk factor in breast cancer has been supported by more than 20 peer-reviewed published scientific articles. The scientific studies average a 30% increased risk of breast cancer due to abortion. Therefore, carrying a child to term presents far less health risk than does abortion. Estrogen is a known carcinogen. When a pregnancy is suddenly interrupted by abortion, especially before the 32nd week, the cancer of vulnerable breast tissue remains in an immature state. As breast lobule maturation is completed at 32 weeks gestation while being exposed to high levels of estrogen, this results in an exponentially higher risk of breast cancer. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about post-abortion syndrome. Studies indicate that 14 to 20% of women who abort will experience post-traumatic stress disorder, otherwise known as PTSD. This means that every year, up to 20,000 Canadian women will experience PTSD after having an abortion. These same studies also found that 50% of women had many, but not all of the symptoms of PTSD, and 65% of women experienced multiple symptoms of PTSD. So if you think about it, Abortion touches the most intimate part of a woman's being. Her very femininity is connected to and defined by the potential for motherhood. At some level, the destruction of a pregnancy is felt as a deprivation, an act of violence against herself. For a large percentage of women, therefore, abortion is experienced as a traumatic experience. So now that you know the statistics of post-abortion syndrome, what does post-abortion syndrome mean? Here is a list of symptoms of post-abortion syndrome. Impacted grieving and an inability to complete the grieving process, self-destructive tendencies such as eating disorders, sexual dysfunction, and substance abuse, feelings of isolation, feelings of confusion and difficulty concentrating, anxiety attacks, irritability, outbursts of rage or anger, aggressive behavior, nightmares or sleeping disorders, and many more. So a study done in Finland found the suicide rate associated with abortion is six times higher than the suicide rate associated with childbirth. A prestigious British journal of psychiatry published a study with a powerful meta-analysis, which revealed that women who had undergone an abortion experienced an 81% increased risk of mental health problems, a 155% greater risk of trying to commit suicide, and that nearly 10% of the incidence of mental health problems were shown to be directly attributable to abortion. So now I will be showing a pre-recorded interview with Dr. Marie peters Ney, a pro-life pediatrician from BC, as she discusses the negative impacts of abortion. Hello, Dr. Marie. Thank you for being with us today. Before we start, can you please share with us a little bit about yourself and how you were involved in the pro-life movement as a doctor? Good. I, um, I'm a pediatrician and 
I was working with Professor Jérôme Lejeune, who is the geneticist, the only pro-life geneticist, the first president of the Pontifical Academy for Life, and the man who discovered that Down syndrome was due to an extra chromosome. And as I was working there, God really put on my path post-abortion and the pain of post-abortion, women, men. I, I had a little outpatient clinic for, for families who had children with Down syndrome. And I was very stunned because I realized there's a lot of post-abortion out there. The pain of abortion is a big issue. And it's become less so. And maybe I would like to say word of why it's become less of a sort of issue right now. One of it is what I call chemical gagging of women, right? So a woman's a little depressed, poop, she goes antidepressant, it's a metabolic disorder, blah, blah, here, antipsychotic, uh, sleeping pills, right? Uh, now marijuana, so women are not allowed to, to say what they feel. When abortion was first legalized, people had a lot more guilt feelings and and anger at, because the anger comes you are demanding from me that i sacrifice my child so as to stay in a relationship or so as not to be thrown out of the house you demand that i sacrifice my baby and myself basically right and that's a pretty heavy uh pretty heavy price to pay, right? How does abortion impact women and families? So you talked about abortion survivors and you also talked about the siblings, how they are affected. Could you go in a little bit more detail into that? Yeah, sure. So a mom finds herself um, pregnant and she goes to the, the boyfriend, the partner, the husband, who steps back and says, well, whatever, it's not of good timing, or either they become very aggressive, it's not my child, and then, and then, uh, whatever, very mean, or then it's, it's your choice, right? Now, any, any woman who's been pregnant knows that it's kind of a, a, a moment where she needs to be enfolded. She needs support, she's happy, but she needs to be enfolded. And so if she does not get that from, from, her, from her husband, she feels very vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. And the beginning of a pregnancy, a woman feels, feels vulnerable. Um, and then if she goes for the abortion, there's enormous anger um, because it's, it's this demanding a human sacrifice from her. It's, I looked for support, I didn't find any, and the heck with you, and I'll show you, and um, there can be a lot of, of um, coercion. Um, a lot of women say that boyfriends, family, they kind of say you have to do it. And, and because the woman is vulnerable at, at the early stages of pregnancy, um, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard when, when people say you have to do it, you have to do it, okay? And I sent you that, that um, film, the, the trailer for a film that a Swiss friend made, and he calls it Power Women. <laughs> Women who have the courage to say, no, it's my baby. All of a sudden, it's a, it's a real empowerment. That's the, the modern word, right? I'm empowered. <laughs> Anyway, so, um, but then she goes through the abortion, and I think every single woman I've talked to, they call it the ultimate rape. And they know that there's no turning back. Um, they have broken something, and it's irreversible, and that's, that's a horrible feeling. Um, to have done something that is irreversible. Um, so there's anger, there's nightmares, and then you're, you, you thought that by doing this, people would welcome you back. The boyfriend would say, okay, no. <laughs> 
you have such anger at the boyfriend anyway most most relationships break up or become very um fraught with trouble and strife um and so you're you're even more alone after and you go and the doctor says oh take some pills and you've got a metabolic and and you start working working and um drinking partying um so it's it's a very hard time in a woman's life i was just also wondering if you have had any experiences counseling women who have had an abortion have you been involved in that in any way yeah yeah my my husband and i do um a thing which he called hope alive he's a psychiatrist right and it's coming to this um where you encounter the person as a whole right so it's not who do you are abortion your abortion no no tell me who you are tell me about yourself tell me about your family tell me about this that the other thing and then you st once you kind of are talking to a you're talking to a human being right it's not tell me about your abortion no no so i'm talking to a human being and i want to know about you i want to know about your family and all all your past suffering and your past so all your disappointments or a lot of things right and then after um you talk about the abortion right all all the grief in your life all the the mourning you have to do in your life and one of the mornings is the baby, but one of the mornings is also the loss of the person I should have been. You know in your heart that you should have been a wonderful doctor, <laughs> you know, a wonderful person, and that this has really damaged you. And you have to mourn that, yes, there's something terrible has happened in your life. Many uh, pro-abortion advocates, they say that post-abortion syndrome is not real. Uh, have you counseled post-abortive women who have experienced this type of PTSD? You know, I think, of course, it's not, they don't hear about it because the women are on antidepressants. They don't, uh, they're not supposed to talk about it, right? right? It's not, you can't go to your workplace and say, I had an abortion. Your coworkers would look at you like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you can go, you can go to your workplace and say, my mother died and everybody clucks around and, 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 uh, but you say, I had an abortion. Nobody cares. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's not a, so the the pro abort say it's not not important it's not interesting it's um and it kind of keeps the women down if you know what i mean instead of being able to say yeah it it happened and it hurt no 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 and um it's it's amazing how women have tried emancipation and i find in our society they have never been so oppressed as now you you can't talk about your abortion you can't do this you can't um you have to have a certain way of thinking you're not allowed to keep your baby last question is do you have any advice that you can give the pro-life youth who will be joining our webinar and all the other pro-life youth um out there do you have any advice you could give them i think we have to rediscover a, a kind of joy and amazement for our life, for each one of us, right? Because young people are sometimes a little bit depressed or no, just a kind of amazement of being alive and that it is good, right? And, and I think also a kind of, young people are good for that, but a kind of compassion because so many of these young people, they've been so neglected you know both parents working and no no time to talk to anybody to to share so enormous neglect enormous uh i don't know who i am i don't know that i have immense value so yeah thank you so much for being yeah. with us dr marie and for sharing all of this knowledge with us we really appreciate okay. it now i have the honor of introducing a canadian pro-life advocate who has served prison sentences for entering abortion clinics to hand out roses and ask women what financial or other help she could offer so they wouldn't go through with murdering their child through abortion. 
Driven by her passion to save lives and to change minds and hearts, Mary Wagner walks into abortion clinics and calmly tries to influence patients to make the choice for life. When Mary intervenes, she does so in breach of court orders. Despite the ever-looming risk of imprisonment, Mary continues to carry out her mission to promote a culture of life. Mary is currently at home with her parents in Victoria, BC, where she cares for her parents, four foster children. She has expressed that this is a very important part part of her life, and she is praying that God will show her the path to which she is called as she embarks on this new journey in her life. Welcome, Mary, and thank you for being with us. Please share with us your testimony. Um, today happens to be the Feast of Our Lady of Czestochowa, and um, anyone with Polish background will have a, a sense of certainly who she is, um, also known as Mary, Queen of Poland. and. Um, she has more and more, since we're talking about women today and especially um, women who are suffering or the risks associated with abortion, I wanted to invoke her intercession um, because she, more and more people are looking to her in the area of post-abortion healing. Uh, we're looking to Our Lady of Czestochowa to be an intercessor. Um, she has on her face scarring. Uh, the image is at least 600 years old. And um, it was defaced centuries ago and left two slashes across her face. And um, artists later tried to fix the damage, but the scar reappeared. And it's for this reason that she has become, in a sense, the patroness of the post-abortive woman, because there's such a deep wound, as, as we realize, but probably more it, it's deeper than most of us realize, and even with the best healing, the best counseling, um, there's still a scar. Like any loss, any death, there is still a pain that remains. So we asked for her intercession, and um, I think it's significant that this is today that we're having this webinar. And um, so I was asked to give a, a brief intro and um, then share some of my experiences. Um, I was born into a, a Catholic family. My mom had um, some difficult pregnancies and gave birth to seven children, and then my parents adopted five children. And um, so from an early age, uh, I learned that life, human life is sacred and it's worth fighting for. Um, as a young adult, I worked in different areas of the pro-life movement. I was a university student, worked on campus, fought the battle there. <laughs> And um, after I graduated from UVic, I, um, I received in prayer sort of a, a reawakening or a, a lifting of the veil that uh, led to really um, understanding more deeply the reality of abortion. And it, it, it crushed my heart, I, but it was a real grace that I gradually began to, to understand, um, which led me to a deeper commitment to women who were abortion-minded and um, even those who were con considering abortion to the point of going to the abortion, to the killing places, um, I, I realized that if I'm committing to them, I have to make room to be committing to them as long and as far as possible. So that means, that meant for me, and, and still does, to go uh, with the woman after all counseling, all prayer um, has not appeared to help the woman discover the gift of her child, to be there for her if she's, if she's still going ahead and if necessary to enter with her, um, still hoping and praying that God can touch your heart. So, um, so as the Fania was saying, it's led to my, my arrest um, and imprisonment for the, over the last 10 years, but there was a period in my youth when I was also doing this. That's when I began in my mid-20s. Um, all of this to lead to what I've come to understand in counseling the woman who is pregnant and abortion-minded, that there are really three key, key elements. Um, first and foremost, prayer and entrustment. Prayer for the mother and the child. Prayer to be God's instrument in any way, materially, emotionally, spiritually, and really entrusting the mother and child to God and to the mother of God, who's um, no, no better mother than the, the mother who, who received Jesus and raised her and um, was given to us at the cross. Um, the second element is a real commitment to the mother and child. Um, 
I think that's obvious for anybody who's already deeply engaged in pro-life work that we can't be casual. We can't just say, well, I've, I've, you know, I've done my nine to five and that's it. If, um, if God has put in our path a woman who is in need, and that might come today online. I have a um, an acquaintance um, friend of my mother who is in uh, Colorado, and he's online with women, and he counsels women online who might be anywhere in the world. And the commitment that it takes is, it has to be um, one of self uh, involving self sacrifice. Um, it has to be one that's total. So if that mother comes to you, we take on a responsibility for her really seriously, and we um, will ask for the help of others if we need it, and most likely we will need it, um, of course, in prayer, but maybe in, in practical ways. So um, just to, to give an understanding of what that, mean, what that means to me, um, obviously I've come to see it as also being there for the woman even at the gates or at the doors of death. But it could also be, um, like my friend who's online and counseling women, we got a, a message from him because this woman was somewhere in Canada, and it turned out she was nowhere near the West Coast, but was in another province entirely. And so what did we do? We tried to network and see if people could help her and assist her. And there was somebody at first who was an hour from her, and then we discovered precisely where she actually was. She was online with him initially, just saying, okay, your, your words are, are great, but I need somebody who can be here for me right now, who can talk to me and reassure me. So he couldn't be. He was in Colorado. She was thousands of kilometers away. But we found within the pro-life family, the gospel of life family, people who would go, who were close to her. And, um, and this was beautiful, and it ended really beautifully because it, it gave her the courage to know that so many people surrounded her, supported her. Okay, so that's the second element. Um, so first being prayer and entrustment. Second, commitment to the mother and the child, involving self-sacrifice. And three, um, tough love. And I've come to see to experience how important this is. You might have um, a good friend who you thought was pro-life, who, who's pregnant and going through this great temptation to abort. And... Um, for your great friend or your sister, you might really fight for that mother and child. But for these people that come into our lives who maybe we don't know, we might not be as inclined, but we have to understand that this is God's child. And in a sense, we need to fight for this child as if this was our own child. Um, I know of somebody who was caring for children and knew the, the mother, well, obviously knew the mother quite well, and this mother became pregnant again, and she said, I just can't cope. I'm going to have an abortion. And um, after much prayer, much counseling, um, the, the mother of this woman, who was against abortion, but didn't want to feel like she wasn't supporting her daughter, was willing to drive her to abort the child. And um, it, it took uh, somebody was stronger in a sense to say, you know, you can't do that. You can't be driving her. Well, yes, she's, she might be alone, but you can't participate in that. So that was sort of the first, the first step of, of, of tough love is saying, I'm not, I'm not going to help you in any way or bet, I bet you in any way. But of course it can't just be negative. We have to show um, that willingness to, to be tough. Um, in a sense that you might lose your friendship, you might lose something, um, the person might be really angry with you because you're, you are not backing down in, in advocating for the child and for her. Because ultimately when we advocate for the child, of course we're advocating for the mother. So in this particular situation, it came down to the abortion being scheduled for the following day and the mother was still adamant, and so this person who was providing the care, um, sometimes for her, her children, said, you know, um, I cannot accept that you would do this. Even if other people can accept it, even if you have a doctor willing to do this, I love you, I love your children, I love your children who are born, and I love this little one who's not born yet. And I know that I will not be able to continue caring for your children knowing that you have killed 
their little brother or sister. I will not be able to do that. And um, thankfully, this was a light bulb moment. This is what it took for this mother to see that something is important to me. This is very important to me that this, I trust this woman. I trust her to care for my kids. And that led her to canceling the appointment. And even though she was at first very angry and she didn't, didn't express everything that worked to her decision um, to cancel the abortion until later, but she was initially very angry and bitter that she was put in that position where she might lose um, this, this woman who was helping her. Um, but as the pregnancy progressed, as she saw the ultrasound of her baby, she started to turn around and she said, you know, I, I can't believe I almost did that. I, I thank you. And the thank yous have never stopped. So that third important element in counseling, tough love. You might fear, and this is where we can be really um, perhaps discouraged, is to give in to fear that um, we might lose something. We might lose that person entirely. Don't give in to fear and trust. And that's where we come back to prayer and, and trust. So the three elements, prayer and entrustment, commitment to the mother and child, involving sacrifice of our time, um, our freedom maybe, and then also uh, tough love, which is genuine love. Okay. Um, so um, I'd just like to share, I, I'm i wondering, um, Stefania, I haven't kept track of time, and I think I'm probably about there, right? I can't, I can't hear a reply now. Not, not for Tanya, but um, yes, if we can move to Jillian's um, section. Okay. And Mary, thank you so much for okay. sharing your wisdom. Thank you. And um, as a reassurance for everyone, Mary is sticking around for questions at the end. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank Mary Wagner, for sharing your amazing testimony with us. And just thank to reiterate, you. Um, she will be sticking around until the end, so feel free to save any questions you may have for her later. Thanks, Jillian. Um, so moving on. Earlier, Zafania talked about the negative effects of abortion, both physically and psychologically. Luckily, this does not have to be every woman's story. There is an alternative to this pain and grief that comes from abortion. Even in the most difficult of circumstances, there is a way through it with the help of crisis pregnancy centers. And as Maeve mentioned earlier, this is the type of healthy feminism and pro-woman mindset we wish to promote. She does not have to be alone and she does not have to revert to killing her child. Instead, we wish for her to embrace her fertility and her journey of motherhood. Something that I noticed when Googling crisis pregnancy centers is that the majority of the search results are articles claiming that crisis pregnancy centers mislead women and hide religious affiliations, but that is not true. So I will take the moment to speak on them because in knowing what they are and what they do, it is undeniable how great they are. Crisis pregnancy centers are nonprofit organizations that help pregnant women along their journey of pregnancy. I personally can't speak from experience, but being, being reminded of the phrase that originates in Africa, I imagine that it takes a village to raise a child. No matter how great one's circumstances are, no woman is expected to raise her child on her own. So crisis pregnancy centers are there to provide to women to ensure that they are not alone in their journey. Services vary between crisis pregnancy centers, but to name a few that are generally offered for free are pregnancy testing and ultrasounds, medical referrals, and post abortive referrals. Some have doctors on site that work with them, but if not, uh, crisis pregnancy centers will refer them to doctors who can provide these services. They provide counseling, baby supplies, and maternal supplies. There is another type of crisis pregnancy center that exists called maternal homes, which are places that provide shelter for mothers that have nowhere to go. To get a better idea of more that goes into a crisis pregnancy center, I got this off the website of the Sisters of Life. The Sisters of Life are a community of nuns that dedicate their ministry to serving women in crisis pregnancies. As you can see, these are all the roles that play a part in their services. There is a wide variety of occupational backgrounds that serve with them. To name a few, they have the Holy Respites, which are families or single women that open their homes to women without places to go. 
They have health professionals to provide medical services like ultrasounds and such. They have university and college contacts to help women through their educational journeys. They have lawyers in case there are legal matters to be handled. I won't name all of them, but I encourage you to check out the website yourself. On the bottom right, we have included where to go when navigating their website. You can find these roles when you click serve with us. We will post the link in the chat if you want to read more about them, perhaps offer your area of expertise or even your time as a volunteer. I wanted to briefly share this success story from a mother and her child and their journey with help from the Massey Center, which is a maternal home in Toronto. Asia was 17 when she found out she was pregnant and decided to keep her baby. She wanted to make a better life for her and her daughter Talia, so she started college at 18. School quickly became difficult and she failed her courses as a result of having too much to juggle, including her two hour commute each way, the difficulty of having to pick up her daughter from daycare if she was sick, and on top of that, her family was threatening to kick her out of the house. Eventually they did and Asia and Talia then moved to the Massey Center where their lives turned around. They live in a townhouse at their center where she can focus on herself and her studies. There she also receives therapy support for herself and her daughter who was having behavioral issues. Today she is thriving. She graduated from college and received her Bachelor of Child Development degree. She has been accepted into a master's program and this fall will be starting her Master of Early Childhood Studies at Ryerson with dreams of becoming a university professor. Asia and Talia are now part of New Life Start Here, which is a housing and educational program for young moms pursuing post-secondary education or training. What started as a daunting journey for Asia has now turned into a prosperous life for her and Talia. This is the type of feminism we wish to support. Although Asia was suffering, she chose life for her daughter. This shows that you really don't have to choose between your child and your career education. So some ways to help. I would just like to point out that crisis pregnancy centers are not government funded. They are donation based and everything they provide is for free. So it is safe to say that they appreciate any help they can get. Some ways that you can help out are by making a donation, whether it be monetary or donating supplies. You can donate your time by organizing clothes, volunteering or helping in their office in any way that you need. You can reach out to your teachers and administration and organize a dress down day and have the proceeds go towards your local center. You can also reach out to your school or parish and organize a baby supply drive and collect baby and maternal supplies to donate. Here on the left, these are photos of the CLC summer interns from 2019. They are at Aid to Women, a crisis pregnancy center in Toronto, helping organize the donations they received that needed to be folded and sorted out. Um, these are baby and maternal supplies crisis pregnancy centers look for and provide to new moms. As you can see, there is a wide range from clothes to car seats. Some of these things you may not have thought of. So this is a great list to refer to when thinking of making a donation. This list is taken from the Aid to Women website. So I suggest you either screenshot the slide or you can check out the website yourself. And we will leave the link in the chat for you to do so after the webinar. Tips on supporting women in crisis pregnancies. I think it's safe to say that many of us are not counselors, but we may find ourselves in the situation where our friends who think they may be pregnant or are pregnant come to us seeking advice and comfort. Perhaps they know how we feel about abortion or not. Regardless, how can we guide them in making the right decision without making them feel judged and without feeling as if we are imposing our religious values or beliefs upon them? With that, I introduce to you Sister Mary Grace and Sister Antoniana from the Sisters of Life who took the time to create this video for all of us participating in this webinar, providing advice for us to use as a guide when speaking to women in crisis pregnancies. Hello, my name is Sister Antoniana. And I'm Sister Mary Grace. And we are the Sisters of Life. And we as Sisters of Life are captivated by the truth and beauty of every human person created in God's image and likeness. We believe that every person is valuable and sacred, good, loved and unique and unrepeatable, and that every person's life has deep meaning and purpose. In fact, we give our very lives for that truth. We would love to share with you today some of the ways we serve those who are pregnant and vulnerable, and also those who have suffered after abortion. You see, in the heart of every woman is a longing to be heard, to be understood, to be believed in, to be seen for her unique beauty and goodness, a beauty and goodness that is all too often not seen in herself. You know, and when we face a time of crisis in our lives, like an unplanned pregnancy, 
It's hardest in those times especially to see this in ourselves. But our dreams are not out of reach when our crisis arises. And in our missions, we know that there are real options that will get women back on their feet again, and that there's real, really no need to feel pressured to have an abortion. But it is pressures and a lot of fear that can arise in the heart of a woman who is pregnant. And so perhaps the best way we can begin to talk is to talk about some of those fears. Because it's by listening to the women longing to be heard and understanding her fears and what she's going through, that we can better meet her where she's at and, and love her with compassion and mercy, walking with her in solidarity so that she can discover anew her own goodness. And so we can together move in, not in fear, but in freedom. So just three of the ways that we've seen, seen that she's most commonly fearful is number one is the experience of feeling alone. You know, that there is no one to support her. All those that she's trusted and hoped to be there aren't there anymore. And this can be a tremendous suffering for any one of us, but especially when we experience a crisis in our lives. Number two, the fear that there isn't a place for the child in the hearts of others in her life. This can include the father of the baby, who she hoped would be there for her, but can't. And instead, she experiences this as rejection of both the child and herself and their relationship. And at times, her parents, too, can be somewhat surprised about the situation and put pressure on the woman to have an abortion. And in society, we know that culture can be a threat that makes her think that she won't make it financially as a single mum. And lastly, what we've seen in the fear of a woman is one of the most difficult fears is the experience uh, that she has to make a decision between either her life or the life of her baby. And that going through with the pregnancy would mean that her life is over. You know, a woman who didn't plan to have a baby this way and at this time can undergo a significant crisis of identity. And the thought that if she carries this baby to full term, her life is over. But there is great reason for hope. Because if a woman connects with you, the greatest help you can offer her is the love of a listening heart. A heart that is willing to listen and to try to understand so that she can rediscover the great strength she has and just how capable she is to love in every situation, even this new one. And so what we found in a few tips that we could share with you is first, love, love, and love. You know, she's not a problem to be solved or she's a person to be loved. One of the most transforming principles that we've learned as Sisters of Life is something called delighting in her. It really begins with creating an environment of inner leisure. So it's like sitting down for a tea party. And then as you sit down and you're not in any kind of rush or any pressure, you reflect back her own goodness, her strength and her beauty. And you literally act as a mirror for her so that she can see her true self which right now is eclipsed because of her crisis. So you listen to her with love and compassion, and you can literally listen her back to life. Another tip is just normalizing her feelings, you know, allowing her to cry, and helping her to get in touch with what her heart is really saying to her. And in her heart, she really does not want to have this abortion, but she feels she has no other choice. You know, another tip is just to believe in her goodness, Help her see that abortion is literally a surrender to everything that she is not. And help her to believe in herself that she is strong and that she can go through with the pregnancy. Addressing the fears she is voicing and helping her think through creative solutions is another tip. Oftentimes there are many pressures that a woman is undergoing. And so uncovering those pressures and then relieving those pressures with practical compassion. And you can do that by linking her with resources. You, know, you can always reach out to us and other resources that we know of. Helping her to come to the conviction that she and her child will make it in the end and that we are with her every step of the way. Remember, perfect love casts out all fear. And so ask the Lord of life to place in your heart a supernatural love for her and that, so that she soon may find that her heart is not fearful. Finally, John Paul II wrote in Evangelium Vitae in the Gospel of Life, that the most effective weapon against the forces of evil is prayer and fasting. And so allow that to be a drumbeat in your life, to pray and to fast against the culture of death. Finally, vulnerability. You know, it's not comfortable to encounter someone else's crisis. So allow your vulnerability to meet hers. You don't need to have all the answers, 
and there are resources for referral to help you. Lastly, keep her, the flame of hope in her heart burning. You, know, you can hope for her when she doesn't have any hope. So we'd love to share with you one story that we experienced in our missions. Uh, we'll call her Claire. We met her just recently, who seemed to be in a good place in her life. She grew up in a Catholic home and was engaged, had just begun volunteering at a local parish youth group. She was your typical Catholic young girl. Life was going well for her. And she had just completed high school when she found out that she was pregnant. Afraid and overwhelmed about what to do, she shared the news with her one church friend who knew us, and they called us from the car in the church parking lot. We drove out to meet them, and for over an hour, we just sat together. We sat and we talked. We talked about all her fears, her hopes and her dreams that were legitimate and real. Claire wasn't homeless or poor. In fact, her boyfriend was a kind man. She was intelligent, and she sure wouldn't face any problems getting a job. Now, unlike any other situations that we often find women in with a lot of other critical pressures and range of crises, Claire really had only one big fear. She said, what will dad say? You know, feeling so ashamed, like her life was over if she kept this baby, she just couldn't bear the thought of her dad rejecting her. Now her dad, he wasn't a criminal, but a good father whose daughter was so afraid to disappoint. So we left her that night and she was very vulnerable to having an abortion. She said to us, thanks for coming out to talk with me, sisters, but I'm still undecided. And so we prayed. And a couple of days later, after reaching out to her numerous times, we heard back from Claire, and she was hardly recognisable over the phone. To our surprise, she bravely mustered up the courage to tell her dad what she had done before, siding, before making the decision of what to do next. She said, I told dad, you know, I told him everything. And her father, he looked at her, and said gently, God doesn't make mistakes. And he embraced Claire. How did that make you feel, we asked. And she said, well, I guess I agreed. <laughs> as simple, as wonderful as that, all she needed was a loving acceptance of her father. And that literally changed everything for her. All the problems and issues that she still had and were still a part of her life were not solved immediately, but they had lost their weight. Because Claire instantaneously, because Claire was accepted entirely by her father, she knew that she was capable of stepping forward with her, with her dad behind her. He didn't judge her, but he just embraced her and loved her where she was. His total acceptance brought her to life and helped her believe in herself once again. I'd like to share the info of crisis pregnancy centers you can inform others of. For Toronto, you can check out Aid to Women or the Sisters of Life, who are also located in some cities in the state. If you don't live in Toronto, a fantastic resource to use is Choice for Two. If you go on their website and enter your location, they list all of the info for crisis pregnancy centers, maternal homes, abortion recovery, private and public adoption, all of that info in your surroundings. I encourage you to check it out and make note of the resources in your area or those closest to you, so that if you are ever in a situation where that info could be of use, you already have it noted. Sister Mary Grace and Sister Antoniana will also be sharing advice on helping post-abortive women. By the way, the Sisters of Life have a YouTube channel as well as a podcast titled Let Love that I encourage you to check out. I, now we would like to share with you um, some of the ways with which we have learned um, and how we serve women who have suffered after abortion, leading them to God's mercy and healing. Now the truth is that everyone you know has been touched by abortion. Whether you know it or not, women and men in our families, at work, at school, in church, in our community, have experienced to some degree or another the wound of abortion. And abortion can leave many women and men suffering from deep shame and guilt, pain, anxiety, depression, fear, and feelings of isolation from God and others. Now, sometimes for many years, they hold this in silence. But there is nothing, absolutely nothing, beyond God's love and mercy. No sin is too big for him. No darkness so great. Abortion is not the end of the story. Now, part of the journey of healing is validating the grief that they have in their hearts and giving them permission to grieve the loss of their child. Now, this opens up areas in their heart to allow God's love and mercy his hope and healing to enter mm -hmm. in. And God has a unique and beautiful plan of healing for every woman. 
who has suffered the experience of an abortion or many, but she doesn't need to suffer alone. In our missions uh, to these brave women who step forward to receive Christ's love and mercy, we've seen them experience peace and healing that comes when we were able to share our burdens with one another. And so we accompany women on this journey of healing and do so by meeting them in person over the phone. We host days of prayer and healing, offering a safe and confidential and non-judgmental environment that can allow each woman to enter into Christ's healing embrace through the sacraments and opportunities to be together. And as the love of Jesus heals, so too does your communication of his love in your love. So your kindness, your compassion, the words that you give them and the offers of support that you allow them to experience can help a woman believe that there is a new beginning awaiting her. And you can give them our number, our website, uh, as we walk with them and invite them to step into his mercy and begin anew with hope. Let me share with you a story of one of the women that we had the privilege to serve, and she gave us permission to share her story with you. Now, I'll call her Veronica. As she read about our Hope and Healing mission in her parish bulletin and saw that we had an upcoming day of prayer and healing, which is a retreat day for those who've suffered after abortion. Now, for 60 years, she kept her abortion a secret, but still kept going to Mass, but not receiving the sacraments. But on this day, she finally received the courage to go to confession. Now, after receiving the sacraments, her whole being radiated joy. Veronica described to us and to the group that was there present that it was only after being set free that she realized she felt trapped all these years as if caught in a net for decades since her abortion. And so now being free after going to the sacrament of confession and receiving the Holy Eucharist for the first time in 60 years, she said, now I'm free. Her journey of healing and freedom continues along with so many other women that we have the privilege to serve and who have the courage to let go of their pain and allow God to fill them with new life. And so we promise you our prayers. Uh, we're here for you. We're with you in this beautiful work and serving life. And the gift of life. So God bless you. God bless you. We're praying for you. So some practical things you can do are to start or contribute to a baby registry for a new mom that could use some help. Baby registries are wish lists created on Amazon where you can donate to buying the items on that list for a particular person. Instagram accounts such as Laura Classen, who started Choice for Two, will post when there is a baby registry you can contribute to. Her Instagram handle is classy and pink. You'll also be able to Google baby registries and find them on social media platforms of other organizations and centers. Next is be informed. And when you learn something new, educate others through conversation and social media. On social media especially, refrain from recycling common posts that circulate in the mainstream media and making posts that are simply react reactions and opinions. Instead, create informative content that is a resource for others that they can then share themselves. By using your platform to embrace life and fertility, uplift women, mothers, and fathers, and simply spread love, you can create a culture of life. New life is exciting, and although we can't neglect the circumstances some women are faced with, we should do everything we can to alleviate her fear. Additionally, we encourage you to offer words of affirmation by congratulating new mothers and pregnant women. Let them know that you're here to, you're here to help in any way you can and emphasize that they are not alone. To mothers who place their children in adoptive care, thank them for choosing life. There seems to be a negative stigma in our society where people look down upon mothers that give up their child for adoption, where in reality, those mothers have discerned a parental plan that's in the best interest of their child. Don't just affirm post-abortive women that they are loved, but show them through your support and actions. Turn to the women in your life and uplift them. Remind them that they are strong, beautiful, and capable. Show your gratitude to your own parents and other mothers and fathers. Let them know they're doing a great job. Offer your help by taking on more responsibilities so they can take breaks. Now, this list might seem overwhelming, and if you feel like your efforts might not be grand enough to make a difference, I'd like to reassure you with one of my favorite quotes from St. Mother Teresa. It's not about how much you do, but how much love you put into what you do that counts. I ask that you keep that in mind moving forward. And as I begin to wrap up, I'd like to start by thanking all of you for being here with us today. We hope we've provided some practical takeaways you can use to further your pro-life efforts. 
We're now going to begin our Q&A session, so I encourage you to put your questions in the chat. 